This is Zach Hafensall, CEO and co-founder of Rise48 Equity. At Rise48, we've completed over $1.7 billion in total transactions, including 11 successful full cycle dispositions. If you're looking to invest with an experienced sponsor in either the Phoenix, Arizona, or Dallas, Texas markets, then set up a call with us today at rise48equity.com backslash invest. That's R-I-S-E 48 equity.com backslash invest. Of course, in a recessionary environment, the number one thing that you're going to think of, and you would be right, is, well, car sales are going to go down. But what we found in our experience is that in a recessionary environment, the service revenue, for example, is, is very sticky. It's very resilient. Hello, left fielders. Welcome to the Passive Investing from Left Field podcast. Our community is focused on networking and education to help people invest passively and think differently. Let's go. This is Todd Dexheimer. You're listening to the Passive Investing from Left Field podcast. Hello, everybody. We are excited today to have Chiro Kirikawa with us uh, today on the podcast. Chiro is a director in the private equity practice ZT Corporate, a boutique uh, private equity firm with investment opportunities for accredited investors. The firm was founded in 1997 and has since cycled over 15 portfolio transactions, representing 50-plus assets. Currently, the firm has an enterprise value of over $1.2 billion with holdings in medical health care, branded auto dealership, and commercial real estate. Cheryl, welcome to the program. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you, Chad. Appreciate the opportunity to chat with you and chat with the LFI community. Absolutely. No, we appreciate it. Well, this, uh, we always like to start out with the easy stuff and just talk about, uh, who you are, where you're from kind of the first off and, and understand the journey of what you've been through to get to where you are today. So feel free to go back as far as you want, but those are the ideas we like to get a hold of first yeah, and foremost. Yeah, yes, sir. So my name is Chihiro, uh, born and raised Los Angeles, uh, the son of, of, uh, Japanese immigrants. Um, and, uh, you know, grew up uh, very fortunately in a middle class um, uh, upbringing and then uh, went to college. And, you know, you've heard this a lot, Chad, right? But I, I did what I thought I was supposed to do, which was go into a corporate job. Right. And I did that uh, and I worked uh, in the insurance industry for a little over a decade. And it really, I, I felt like I was trapped in that industry, in that job. Uh, doing insurance claims. Little did I know, I had painted myself into a corner, mm -hmm. and I, it was always within my power to paint myself out of it. Uh, it just took me a little while. I guess I'm a late bloomer. It took me a little <laughs> while to figure that out. Um, and the first step towards actualizing my uh, escape, if you will, was going to business school. So I did that and from there, I was able to transition out of an industry that I wasn't enjoying, and I got into uh, what I felt was uh, going to be the answer for me, and that was analytics. And so I worked at a major public corporation, one of the world's largest companies doing analytics, and found that to be a little lacking after about a year as well. And that's when I started investing in real estate and started my own firm uh, as a multifamily syndicator, uh, really started getting into it in 2016, 17. And then it took me until uh, 19, early 2019, uh, to close um, my very first deal. And then uh, from there, built a portfolio of four properties, uh, just under 600 doors. And then, uh, and then came yet another transition where um, I initially had ambitions of like creating my own firm and uh, having a couple or a few partners and and chasing deals and having a good old time doing that right. uh, as, as a captain of a ship. But as it turned out, uh, the industry was and is and remains great. Uh, commercial real estate, I have tremendous belief in that personally and professionally. Uh, but for me, uh, I was uh, starting to get lonely working as a solo entrepreneur. And of course, it is a, real estate is a team sport, 100% right. I'm forming teams, uh, taking down deals. But uh, as a firm, as, a, as an investing uh, company, I was a one-man operation. And so I started looking again and thought, okay, I want to remain in private equity. I love this kind of business. I'm a deal guy. I love chasing deals. I love that uh, excitement aspect of it. But I want to do this in an institutional capacity 
as a part of a team uh, where I can support and I can be supported. And uh, that uh, started me on a journey uh, where I ended up at my current firm, ZT Corporate, um, and haven't looked back. Uh, have really enjoyed the variety of deals that we can um, pursue, and the fact that we're really professionalized in the sense that we've got, you know, an M and A team. That's their job is to is to send out offers. There's a private equity team where our job is to do capital formation. There's people in charge of lending. You know, all that is all uh, uh, very well resourced. So I've been enjoying being in the institutional side of things uh, of private equity. Yeah, no, it, that sounds like uh, quite a leap to go from being a solo multifamily syndicator to a larger corporation with multiple facets available and, and people. Can you talk about how that transition worked for you? Were you were you running towards it because you were looking for the help and the education that you got from it? Was it difficult to you know cut the ties of being your own boss and kind of moving to a, a corporate entity instead? How how'd that go? You know, it wasn't uh, that difficult of a transition for me. You know, there's not a whole lot that I miss from my corporate uh, history. Um, but the one thing I did miss was uh, just that camaraderie, that that team element of, of doing projects together. Uh, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of that in stages when you're doing a multifamily deal. Uh, but then when you're in the asset management phase, uh, it, it's, it's a lot more hands off, right? Sure. Yeah. And so, um, there isn't that element of, there isn't a consistent, uh, element of, um, getting after some sort of goal or goals with, with, a, uh, a team, unless, um, you're in that kind of acquisition phase or getting a deal under contract or raising the capital for that deal, what have you. So yeah. um, long story short, Chad, yeah, I found it uh, very refreshing um, and enjoyable to go back into that <laughs> sort of environment of working uh, at a company. And I should mention, we're a small firm. Uh, we have fewer than 100 people um, in the corporate uh, side of things. Overall, yeah. uh, including our portfolio operations, we've got 3,000 employees. Um, yeah. But yeah. In terms of what we're doing as investors, you know, there's fewer than a hundred, so uh, it's still very scrappy, a very resourceful <laughs> group of people, um, and we end up wearing a lot of hats. Yeah, no, as I could imagine, but still a, a far cry from doing it all by yourself, too. I'm sure. So uh, there's pros and cons of that. So in the in the bio, I read about all the different kind of asset classes you're focused on. It's very kind of diverse. Can you talk about maybe what's attractive about healthcare businesses and dealerships, car dealerships. That's quite a, a range of uh, different topics that you're dealing with there it on is. a day-to-day -day basis. Very, uh, disparate businesses, which is good from a diversification standpoint, right? So let me kind of back up and talk about how we got our start. So um, we were founded in 1997 as a financial advisory doing stocks and bonds. And mm -hmm. of course, shortly thereafter was the dot-com crash, right? And so our founder, Tasir Badar, uh, found himself very disillusioned with the lack of control over equities and bonds. And thus, our destiny was born to become a private equity firm where we're buying, uh, holding, and growing um, operating businesses. And so the first business that uh, we opened up, we started building the private equity practice and then literally building the facility in 2001. And then uh, after a couple of years of building and setting uh, up entities and, and, uh, and partnerships, we opened the doors on our first facility, which was a medical facility. And what was really innovative about that was it was three businesses in one. It was an uh, outpatient surgery center, so any sort of surgery that does not require overnight stays. Mm -hmm. And an imaging center such that now we don't need to send somebody to another business in another location for pre or post op uh, surgery. And then thirdly, uh, the, the great innovation there was uh, to see or realize, well, we're not generating any revenue at night. But what if we put in a pulmonologist practice and they're operating a sleep uh, clinic? So now they're <laughs> doing sleep apnea studies, cardiac uh uh, studies and treatment while people are sleeping. So now we've got three businesses generating revenue and we're generating revenue at night as well as day. And so uh, we did really well with 
with those businesses and uh, that was our start and then we from there diversified still within healthcare but diversified into various different businesses like pharmacies emergency rooms hospitals hospices uh, and the like and um around uh 10 <clears throat> excuse me 10 or so years ago uh we had a big sales and marketing team that was uh just driving all around town and mm. so we were leasing and buying a ton of cars uh upwards of dozens of cars a year and so we started developing strong relationships with certain dealerships in the houston area where we're based and uh, one of the GMs there approached us and said, hey, um, you might want to get into the dealership business. And once we did some due diligence on it and saw the cash flows and the margins on it, we were like, well, shoot, that is a really good business. Um, and, but it's hard to break into. So with the help of uh, through a partnership with somebody who had decades of experience in the dealership uh, operational space, we were able to break into that industry. And uh, so that was in 2014, nine years ago, uh, we, we got into uh, the dealership uh, industry and, and we achieved that through partnership with uh, somebody who had experience. And that's how, that's how a new person gets started in commercial real estate too, right? If you don't have True. an operational background, what do you do? You need to find somebody. Partner or, somebody with it. Yeah. 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 So that's exactly what we did. And then, uh, and then if you imagine, you know, if you're in the business of uh, building emergency rooms and surgery centers and hospitals and dealerships, well, you're in, you're by default, you're in uh, uh, commercial real estate too, right? <laughs> That's you're a developer fair. in some sense. So, uh, and, and we actually ended up uh, building a class A office building in a Houston suburb as well. And that served as our headquarters for a number of years. Yeah. So we've done commercial real estate. Um through the growth of our um, business over the last 26 years. And uh, naturally, it made sense for us to proceed into commercial real estate as well. And so uh, we uh, established a fund. To do, yeah. Uh, well, I, was, commercial real estate. I was just going to ask that of like, how, how are you structuring deal offerings that you present to, the, to your investor base? Is it single asset? Is it fund based? Is it blending medical and car dealership? How do you how do you approach that process? Yeah, great question. So when we were smaller, it was deal by deal. Yeah, um, single asset. Hey, we're doing a hospice deal here in San Antonio or here in Dallas, and we're going to raise for it. Um, but uh, we eventually moved to we kind of grew out of that, right? So <laughs> what we do on the healthcare side. Um, and we do keep healthcare and uh, ZT Automotive separate. So okay. um, you're not going to invest in both through one investment. You would have to invest in each holding company. Gotcha. Uh, but so, yeah, you will you would invest in um, the healthcare holding company, for example, uh, and then there would be a preferred return uh, and, um, and, and you would be investing in on a portfolio basis you know we might deploy that capital in the purchase of uh, multiple facilities at one once that's typically how we'll we'll go so we might have an equity raise on the healthcare side because we're going to buy eight emergency rooms or or something to that effect gotcha yeah i d thought that would bring some interesting diversity to a fund if you were blending car dealerships and, yeah, and healthcare yeah, but we don't, that yeah, we that's don't really hard that. to underwrite as an investor probably to figure out if uh this makes sense to get yeah around, yeah that so. would complicate that yeah and so similarly <laughs> on the on the dealership side uh we'll acquire a few or several stores at once and then we'll raise uh for that portfolio of dealerships that we're buying makes sense are you looking for a way to invest at a lower minimum and participate in more deals? Look no further than our weekly deal webinars hosted in collaboration with TribeVest. With every deal we offer, left field investors have the option to join an open tribe, allowing you to invest for as little as $10,000. No need to meet the standard $50,000 minimum. Joining an open tribe is easy. TribeVest handles all of the setup, fund collection and distribution, and even provides K-1s for tax time. All you have to do is sign up. Stay up to date with LFI by subscribing to our emails and gaining Clubhouse access to join our deal webinars and open tribes. Don't miss out. Hello, left fielders. 
At LFI, you know our focus is on networking and education. Mark your calendars because we're going to have a full day of it dedicated to you, our limited partners at the best ever conference on April 9th in Salt Lake City. LFI is opening the BEC with Passive Investing with Left Field Investors, an event focused on passive investors. This will be where insightful content meets passionate limited partners. If you enjoyed BEC last year and the meetup in Left Field this year, then imagine them both back to back. The best ever conference isn't just any event. It's the premier conference for commercial real estate investors and operators. Your ticket to passive investing with left field investors includes admission to the entire best ever conference from April 9th through the 12th. Join us April 9th where we will have a packed agenda with sessions focused on how to be a successful limited partner led by experienced LPs, top operators, and partners. Then, immerse yourself in the full Best Ever Conference where you will be surrounded by like-minded investors, operators, and industry experts for unparalleled opportunities for learning and networking. The best part, and there are so many, but the best part, you won't find a bigger discount on the regular ticket price than the one you get for being an infielder. That's more content for an exclusive lower price. Register for the event today at leftfieldinvestors.com slash BEC, and we will see you at Passive Investing with Left Field Investors at the BEC. We were talking a little bit before we punched record here about just current economy, current state of the you know economic conditions that are out there and how you know people are maybe on the sideline a little bit more, but you're, you're a pro for still getting involved with this. Can you talk about why you feel like this point in time, it's still a good idea to be getting into commercial real estate, whether it's distressed, whatever. Uh, can you speak to, you know, where you see value there that, uh, should interest people to still look at it as an investment opportunity? Yeah. So I, th- um, our belief is that we're, we have a narrow window of opportunity right now to, uh, chase commercial real estate. So um, we've just opened up a commercial real estate fund. And the focus of that, it's going to be about 70% hospitality and 30% multifamily. And we're doing uh, one one key aspect is it's all cash transactions. So, um, uh, you know, we're not bringing any debt to the table. So mm-hmm. then the deal has to have a um, uh, it has to cash flow on current performance, um, even without any debt. Um, and it, it's hard to do that with a, a listed deal. So here's what yeah. we're doing, Chad, is we're going directly to the asset managers at major banks um, that have t- taken back assets or are in the process. So we're we're going after the deals that are either already on the bank's books or they're on their short list. You know, yeah. when that asset management team is meeting on Monday mornings at XYZ Bank and there's those three on the spreadsheet, three hotels or multifamily that are highlighted in red and they're like, oh, gosh, we got to talk about these three again. Like, what's <laughs> going on with these? You know, they're not making debt service. Uh, how what are we doing with these? So um, we want to be the guy. Uh, we want to be the firm to buy that. So. Um, we're in daily contact with the asset managers and they, those banks want two things. They want discretion. They don't want to take that thing to the whole market. They don't, they're not going to list it with Burkadia or, or Marcus and Milicep. They don't want the world to know that, uh, you know, we, we took this asset back. Right. Secondly, they don't want financing. Uh, they need certainty of close and they need quick close. Right. So they want cash buyers and, Another element of that is if, say, Chase has a, an asset on their books that they want to get rid of and the buyer is trying to finance it through Wells Fargo, well, Chase just opened the kimono to their competitor that they've taken back this asset. They don't want that, right? True. So um, with a cash buyer, they, they solve two problems, which is discretion and speed. And so we want to be Johnny on the spot to take advantage of these opportunities at great prices. And we don't think this window is going to be open very long. Um, there, you know, there, there's a number of big players like Starwood or, or uh, Invesco that have distressed commercial real estate funds. Um, but they're, they're big, big players. Um, and uh, we like where we are at our size, where we can be a little nimbler. And we're going to go after assets that are too small for them. So um, we, we think we have a, a small window to take advantage of this and we're, we're jumping in. No, oh, that's interesting that you can find that position. You guys have the, the size and the ability, the relationships 
to dig into that side. I used to be in banking. I used to see that list that was published all the time. Okay. Uh, and always yeah. thought how interesting to be able to tap into that population of, of properties that you could, you know, find at usually a very good deal because the banks are just looking to cover their costs. Usually they aren't right. there to make a profit on all those and they want to get them off the books as soon as they can. Cause it's costing them money to have them sit there. So yep. very interesting to take that, uh, Avenue. So commercial real estate's like another pillar of what you guys are focused on, on top of the medical healthcare facilities and the car dealerships. Um, how, what, how does somebody underwrite all these kind of scenarios? Maybe you can, can you give me maybe two or three kind of metrics that you usually say people should pay attention to in any of those asset classes, just to help us understand, you know, we're a population, our, our community is a bunch of limited partner investors. What would that investor really want to be looking at when they're comparing healthcare facilities versus car dealerships versus multifamily and that kind of thing that you're also looking at. Uh huh. So one thing that uh, distinguishes our deals from uh, a deal you might get from a multifamily syndicator is you'll actually see audited financials from us. Mm. Um, and so you're going to get a balance sheet and an income statement and a cash flow statement that was uh, that was audited by a major accounting firm. And so you'll see, okay, well, what's their what's their uh, debt to asset ratio, you know, what's their gross margins, um, all, all of that's, uh, it's in there. So um, basically any any KPI that's important to you that, that can come out of an income statement or a balance sheet, like it's going to be there at your disposal. Um, and the reason we do that, Chad, is we're looking to sell to institutional buyers, right? Mm -hmm. If we're going to sell 27 emergency rooms that are generating, let's say, $75 million a year in earnings, um, that's going to be an institutional uh, player, probably a private equity firm um, of some sort. And so uh, they're, they won't buy um, $75 million a, million a year in earnings based on a pro forma yeah. or based on, a, on an Excel spreadsheet. It's got to get uh, be audited financials. And so um, we provide that uh, to anybody who is seriously considering becoming a, a limited partner with us. Yeah. What's your hold times usually for these different Typically asset classes? Three to five years. To five. Um, uh, some longer ones have. Uh, so we had a liquidity event with our, our dealership business in March of this year. And uh, that one was a little bit longer. Our earliest equity investors were in for almost nine years. Okay. Uh, but typically, our deal uh, hold time is three to five. Gotcha. Interesting. They, that's helpful. Um, some of the other questions, again, thinking from a perspective of a limited partner, are just what are what are some of the contingencies that you put together to structure around the market that you're investing in to uh, prepare for downturns? You know, obviously, we've had weird economy the last couple of years. We've had a pandemic. Everything else. Can you speak? through some of the contingencies that you put together to plan for certain things and, and maybe describe what markets you focus on. Are you staying around Houston or do you go broader than that as well? Yeah. Uh, market wise, we're uh, it's similar to multifamily in that we're pretty uh, focused on Sunbelt, you mm. know? Mm -hmm. So uh, Texas is a major market of, of interest to us, Georgia, Florida, Carolinas, uh, these are states that that we buy businesses in. Gotcha. Um, uh, you know, this the same thing. Same things that are tailwinds for commercial real estate or tailwinds for selling cars or or any sort of medical business, right? You want more people moving in than moving out, and you want a, a an economy that's growing, and you want a business friendly uh, regulatory environment, and that you know is highly correlated with landlord friendly as well, generally you know, uh, they go hand in hand. So mm -hmm. um, those are key things. In terms of recession resistance, I would say uh, number one is how much cash is on the on the balance sheet, you know? Uh, so um, having having dry powder is, is key in any sort of event. Yeah. And so um, that's yeah. something that uh, gives me comfort when I see on our balance sheet that we have, you know, a, a few uh, tens of millions of dollars on the on the balance sheet for either of our holding companies. Um, another thing is, is you want to know uh, what's the, what's kind of the long-term prospects of that business, right? So a lot of people don't know, for example, in the, 
in the auto dealership business. It's actually a fairly diversified business in itself. It's not just a business that sells uh, cars and trucks. Um, there's, uh, there's also a parts business. There's also a service business. Sometimes there's a collision center uh, mm. on site. And there's a big uh, element of finance and insurance as well. So the dealership is going to make uh, some money on the financing of that vehicle. They're also going to make money uh, selling uh, ancillary insurance products, like something like tire and wheel insurance or windshield coverage or an extended warranty or a maintenance plan. All of those are profit drivers for dealerships. And, um, uh, of course, in a recessionary environment, the number one thing that you're going to think of, and you would be right, is, well, car, car sales are going to go down. Yeah. Um, but uh, what we found in our experience is that in a recessionary environment, the service revenue, for example, is, is very sticky. It's very resilient because people might hold off on buying a new car, but those people who uh, really have faith in their local dealership to do the best job uh, in, in maintaining their uh, Chevy or their Mercedes, um, yeah. that's, a, that's a strong belief that those consumers have, and uh, they are typically very sticky with their local dealership and will come back um, even in recessionary environments to continue getting their oil changes and such. Um, no, that's fair. That's about as big of a relationship business as there is out there, you know, yeah. compared to even investing in real estate. It's, it's, we are, we're, we're pretty loyal to our mechanics. It seems like at the end of the day, if we found somebody Indeed. we like anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And then flip into the healthcare side. Um, you know, we're, we're invested currently in emergency rooms. So we're the largest owner operator of freestanding emergency rooms in Texas. Uh, we have 27 facilities. And uh, that that is a fairly recession resistant uh, business. Um, you know, if you if you sprain your ankle severely, uh, you're not going to not get that seen, generally sure. speaking. And um, and so uh, we, we like the complementary aspect of uh, dealerships and healthcare. Yeah, I could see where that model would work better. I know you talked about doing some outpatient stuff there. Uh, that could be recession intolerant, uh, but at least having that diversity with the ERs as well, you know, could help mm -hmm. smooth those, pr protect that investment a little bit more. Yeah, we've actually divested, uh, we've sold out of um, uh, basically all of our healthcare businesses, um, almost all of them. We We really have very small holdings in uh, some remaining businesses. Really, uh, almost all of our focus in our in our assets are in our emergency rooms today. So, gotcha. You know how we were talking about our three to five year hold period? Yeah. Uh, we've executed our business plans on our hospices and hospitals and, and what have you. And gotcha. So right now, our, our, uh, our business of focus is emergency rooms. Gotcha. Interesting. Um, again, speaking to our community being limited partner investors, can you share maybe some mistakes that you've seen passive investors make and, you know, something we can give some guidance around if they wanted to look at ZT corporate for some investment opportunities, what have been areas that people have made mistakes or lessons learned maybe that you could share that our group could think about if they were interested in looking at uh, investing with you guys. Yeah, I'll tell you an escape, uh, a mistake that I made as an LP because <laughs> I'm an active limited partner in uh, various deals, uh, not just real estate. Mm -hmm. um, but one mistake I made was I didn't do enough due diligence. So um, this was an oil and gas deal, and I knew I knew one guy uh, who was in that deal, and so you know. I, I picked his brain and he said, yeah, I've been getting my, my dividends. Um, seems pretty good so far. And that was as far as I went. And I yeah. said, okay, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. But I, I should have tried to find, you know, uh, one, probably at least two, two other people to talk to. Because lo and behold, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say uh, buyer's remorse, Chad. But, <laughs> you know, afterwards, in the months since I've met other oil and gas operators and um and and i've been more so i've been more educated since and i've yeah. learned oh well you know had i known uh these other operators i probably would have gone with one of them instead of the one i went with but um 
you know, you live and you learn. So uh, you, and you learn. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you we know. learn from our mistakes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And I don't know that it's a mistake that that would probably be uh, uncharitable to this operator, but uh, yeah. there's certain things that are certainly more. Um, uh, advantageous towards the LP uh, with other operators in terms of fees and and deal structure and such. So yeah, um, yeah. so I just that's, went into it a little too naively. No, uh, I under, that's un, un, understandable. I think a lot of people go into this business solo, and that's why we preach find a community so that you can help learn vet more before you really pull a trigger on some of this stuff. So uh case in point, you know, hopefully you can avoid that because now you know more, but yeah. Um, really good stuff, Jira. I really appreciate you coming on today. Uh, where can our listeners get a hold of you if they want to reach out and touch base? Yeah, I'm on Instagram, uh, CG Kurokawa. I'm uh, pretty easy to find on Facebook as well. Um, and Japanese names may be unusual, but they are phonetic. So Chihiro Kurokawa. Um, uh, if you can say it, you can you can spell it. Um, there you go. Can be found. That's good. And I'm active on LinkedIn as well. We'll get it into the show notes too, so people can track <laughs> you down. Uh, last thing I'll ask you, we ask everybody when they're on the show, what's a favorite podcast that you listen to that you could share with the group that might be helpful for them too? Thank you for this question. I, I love that you asked this of your guests. Um, uh, there's one called Acquired that I love. Um, they they will literally do like a four hour podcast on, uh, say, the history of Walmart. Um, oh wow! So you've got to take it in bite sized chunks, wow. obviously. Yeah. Uh, but they go into tremendous detail um, uh, from beginning to end of various fascinating companies like uh nike or uh or they even did one on the history of the nfl they did oh, one wow. on the nba um so uh really tremendous uh depth of research and it's fun to listen to if you're a investing wonk like i am and i'm sure you are chad so <laughs> i highly recommend acquired i have not heard of this so i'm gonna check this out especially uh my next big road trip that'll give me a good uh fill the time kind of podcast to listen to. Well, I really appreciate you coming on again today. Thank you for that. Uh, and hopefully the listeners enjoyed it as well. All right. Thank you very much. You bet. Investing in syndications can be a daunting task. Wiring a large sum of your hard earned money to someone you talk to on the phone for 30 minutes can certainly be scary. How can you be confident in what you're doing? Steve Sue, one of the founders of LFI just published a book called avoiding rookie errors as a left field investor. 20 lessons learned from 14 years of investing in private syndications. This is by far the best book I've read on syndication investing. It's an easy to read book, chock full of great advice from Steve's experience as a passive investor. It is a must read. Whether you're a first time passive investor or a veteran, go to www.leftfieldinvestors.com slash books and click on the link to avoiding rookie errors as a left field investor. If you are a passive investor, you gotta read this book. Visor provides investors with a secure platform that displays a comprehensive view of all of their holdings on a single holistic dashboard. From real estate syndications to private equity, crypto to traditional investments with AI-driven, unbiased, honest insights to maximize return, Visor is your one place to rule them all. Automating performance tracking, projecting future cash flow, analyzing all your financial documents and much more in one powerful solution making it easy to follow the money sign up for a free 30-day trial now at pfizer.co really enjoyed my conversation with Chihiro today i thought it was very interesting to listen to him describe how their private equity firm is considered to be a team sport and how they've adapted and pivoted to their environment to make their business a better business by, you know, having a lack of control ahead of time and pivoting so that they could get to private equity so they could be in, tr in control more and adapt to new means of revenue models. I, I think that shows some great leadership in their company and being able to find ways to work within all of those pieces. Uh, I liked how he talked about their commercial real estate fund and their focus on cash purchasing of deals and finding them from banks so that they can set themselves up with a really strong position ahead of the purchase. 
A lot of times we say you make your money in the sa- in the purchase of a deal, not in the sale. Uh, I feel like they're taking an approach that really opens that door to be successful as well, especially when they're getting to the granularity of due diligence by getting getting audited financials. I think that's really interesting that that would be available for investors to do their due diligence due diligence around their deals, which would be fantastic. Uh, I liked also how they talked about in his contingencies that they hold a lot of cash for the rainy days and they try to find diversity in the asset classes that they buy so that they have multiple income streams from an asset, like talking about car dealerships and how you have car sales, but you'd also have maintenance, how ERs are basically recession proof. I I think that all makes sense. Um, And I liked his advice for investors to make sure you're doing enough due diligence. He talked about how he got into oil and gas and he only knew one guy. Uh, It's exactly why we say get involved with the community so that you can vet a deal more thoroughly with other opinions to make sure that you're making the right decisions. So really good stuff from Chihiro today. Really appreciate him coming on. I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. Thanks for hanging out in the left field with us today. If you are interested in becoming a left fielder, you can find us on the World Wide Web at www.leftfieldinvestor.com and click the subscribe button to join our community. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to the show on your podcast player so you don't miss an episode. If you really enjoyed the show, a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts would be appreciated. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be considered financial advice. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show was copyrighted by Passive Investing from Left Field and Left Field Investors. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.